Welcome to the Databricks Skill Builder Series. We're glad you're here. Awesome. Well, it looks like we're starting to get uh, some of our folks to come in and we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to first say uh, thanks to Allison Baker for showing up today to teach us about cluster sizing and instance types. She is a solutions architect here at Databricks um, on the retail team. And uh, I'll just go ahead and hand it over. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. As folks trickle in, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started, um, but I'll introduce myself quickly. I've been with Databricks for about a year and a half, and my background is primarily in data science, and I directed a team of BI engineers and data scientists, so I learned quite a bit in the last year and a half about cloud operations, and so I'm really excited to share what I've learned. Feel free to jump in, challenge me at any point in time. We'll have a couple other folks on from Databricks as well to help triage any questions. So what we're going to walk through today, I split this into four parts. We'll talk about the computation resources, give somewhat of a background, high-level overview of that, dive into cluster configurations, cluster sizing, and then also how to establish a baseline depending on your data source. All right, so first off, let's talk high level best practices. Use the latest Databricks LTS runtime. The most recent release, 11.3, was not LTS. Uh, I'm sorry, 11.2 was not. 11.3 will be. 11.3 beta is now in GA. Use Photon. Also, set your auto termination as part of your cluster policy. So, auto termination is triggered by a period of absence cluster commands, but not commands run by SSH or bash. Make sure you're using the right instance types, and that's where we're going to focus on today. Consider logging for better monitoring and reporting. Also enable cluster auto scaling, and this will also enable auto scaling for your local SSD storage, and that now does pertain to GCP. You can do that via the API on GCP. You won't see the enable auto scaling SSD on the UI yet in GCP, but that is coming. For clusters with over 20 workers, make sure you review those workloads for optimization opportunities. Limit the type of clusters that users can attach to or spin up and do that with your, your cluster access controls and your, um, uh, your governance that you put in place. Leverage your VM spot instances for workloads that can handle interruptions. So you'll create a warm pool of spot VMs using the instance pools API. And another rule of thumb, restart long running clusters after two weeks. All right, computation resources. So a cluster is, what is a cluster? It's a collection of virtual machines on which you run data engineering, data science, and data analytics work, so workloads. And this, these clusters allow you to treat a group of computers or worker nodes as a single computer that's orchestrated by a driver node. Generally speaking, the fewer nodes there are, the better since you incur less shuffle IO overhead. So you're moving data within the node and not across the network. Larger VM types also tend to feature more network bandwidth. So if you are reading very large amounts of data, this will work in your favor. However, keep in mind that larger nodes with more memory per VM do tend to come with higher costs. So as a rule of thumb, try to use the largest machines that you can that have less than 128 gigs of memory. And those tend to be the middle offerings in the instance families. You can create a cluster using the cluster's UI, CLI, or REST API, and the cluster manager in the control is in the control plane, and that will request the VMs for your cluster and launch them in the data plane. After your cluster is created, you can use it to run, again, interactive workloads by attaching notebooks and executing commands on those clusters. Now, in addition to interactive workloads, you can also run automated workloads on clusters via jobs. And a job is a way of running a notebook or a jar either immediately or on some sort of triggered schedule basis. You can manage and monitor these jobs using the jobs UI, the CLI, or API. Okay, so let's dive into this a little bit more. Databricks makes the distinction between all-purpose clusters and job clusters. And when you create a cluster using the cluster's UI, you create an all-purpose cluster, which can be used to run workloads interactively and with notebooks. 
when you create a job, you have the option to use an existing all-purpose cluster, or you can create a new jobs cluster. And jobs clusters are ephemeral. They are created for the job and they terminate upon the job's completion, unlike all-purpose clusters, which are persistent and can be manually restarted. All purpose clusters can be shared among multiple users for collaborative interactive analysis and job clusters allow users to run fast and robust automated jobs with isolation and scheduled runs. Jobs along with their significantly lower compute costs are great for production and repeated workloads. All purpose clusters are great for analytics and ad hoc work. You can optionally configure clusters to pull VMs from a pool, and this is a set of idle, ready-to-use instances that allow you to reduce cluster start and auto-scaling times. And when a cluster attaches to a pool, or when a cluster attached to a pool needs an instance, it first attempts to allocate one of the pool's idle instances. And if the pool has no idle instances, the pool expands by allocating a new instance from the instance provider in order to accommodate the cluster's request. When a, when a cluster releases an instance, it returns that to the pool and it's now free for another cluster to use. Only clusters attached to a pool can use that pool's instances. Attaching a cluster to a pool saves instance acquisition time, which can be sig a significant amount of time with many libraries and dependencies, depending on what your workloads require. Without pools, short jobs can waste more time starting than actually running the workload themselves. And while Databricks doesn't charge DBUs for idle instances, your cloud provider does. So you do want to make sure that you're limiting your configurations within your pool, making sure that you're managing costs appropriately there. All right, cluster configurations. This is where we really get in the meat. So we saw, showed earlier, um, I'll talk, we just talked about pools. Let's talk about pools again. Keeping idle VM instances in a pool, it's really great for performance, but it comes at a cost. And Databricks, again, doesn't charge for those idle instances, but your cloud provider will. So there are a few recommendations that we'd like to make to ensure that you're configuring your pool so that you're minimizing your costs, but you're also meeting your computation needs. So if you're only running interactive workloads during, let's say, business hours, then you want to make sure that your min idle instance count is set to zero after hours. Or if your automated data pipelines run for just a few hours at night, then you want to set the min idle count a few minutes before the pipeline starts and then revert it to zero afterwards. And alternatively, you can always keep a min idle of zero, but set the idle instance auto termination timeout to meet your needs. So the first job run on the pool is going to start slowly, but then subsequent jobs run within the timeout period and those will start quickly. Then when jobs are done, all of the instances in the pool will terminate after the idle timeout period, which is going to help you avoid those cloud provider costs. You can also budget VM resources by setting a maximum capacity for the pool, and this is going to limit the sum of all of the idle instances and the instances used by the clusters attached to that pool. Databricks runtimes, this is a set of core components that run on your cluster. So all Databricks runtimes include Apache Spark and also then add com added components and updates that improve usability, performance, and the security around your jobs. You want to make sure that you're reviewing the latest Databricks runtime release features and where you can migrate your clusters to the latest version. You will need to restart those jobs and start them up again. But this is ensuring that you're including the, the best performance stability, and you also get some new features involved as, in, included as well. And right now, like I said, we're on 11.3 beta, which is the, the newest LTS version, and we will be GAing later this month. So check the release notes. Databricks also offers several types of runtimes and runtime version types. So you have, like I mentioned, the Databricks 
regular runtime, which adds the number of components and updates around security and usability. And then you have ML specific runtimes. And this is a variant of the Databricks runtime. And these add multiple popular ML libraries, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, and XGBoost. And there's also a Databricks runtime for genomics, which is optimized for working with genomic and biomedical data. That one's not listed here, but it is available. And that version is 7.3. Auto scaling is uh, a, a component that is going to automatically add or remove worker nodes in response to the changing workloads so that you're optimizing your usage. So when auto scaling is enabled, Databricks is going to automatically choose the appropriate number of workers that are required to run your Spark job, which is gonna make it easier to achieve high cluster utilization because now you don't have to worry about precisely exactly provisioning a cluster to match your workload. So now your workloads can run faster compared to running a constant sized under provisioned cluster. And you can also reduce overall costs compared to a statically sized cluster. When you enable auto scaling, you can specify the minimum, the maximum number of nodes in the cluster and setting this range for the number of workers does require some experimentation. So you'll wanna be looking at the ganglia graphs, which we'll take a look at here in a few moments. Ad hoc usage or business analytics is generally where there's a lot of variance between the number of min and max workers. For, for production batch jobs, you can leverage auto scaling off um, you can uh, leverage auto scaling off and you can then add a buffer on the upper limit, but don't use auto scaling for streaming workloads. So the default behavior with auto scaling on structured streaming is that the cluster will auto scale up when it is needed to, but it will stay at that max number that it auto scales up to and it will not auto scale back down. Now enhanced auto scaling where on streaming jobs, it will auto scale back down is in the process of being released privately, publicly and going through that whole process in DLT. But ensure that if you are in production today and you have your structured streaming jobs set to auto scale, monitor those ganglia reports, work with your SAs and reach out to us and we can help you identify where is the optimal place to put your set number of workers so that you're not auto scaling on those structured streaming jobs. During cluster creation, you can also specify an inactivity period in minutes. And this is when you want the cluster to terminate. If the difference between the current time and the last command run on the cluster, if it's more than the inactivity, inactivity period that's specified, then Databricks automatically terminates the cluster. And it's recommended to enable auto termination for your ad hoc clusters so that you prevent idle clusters from running overnight or on weekends. And the standard clusters are configured to terminate automatically after 120 minutes. And you can make changes to that based off of how you, how you set your, your governance and your cluster policies. This is where it gets juicy. So the list of available machine types, it can be really daunting. And you actually see, I have been poking around asking folks the last couple of days for that empty space. So if anybody has any, any experience or any recommendations for GCP storage optimized compute, please raise a hand or let us know on the chat. So Databricks automatically organizes the machine types into these different workload type groups. So you can kind of think of your jobs in, in, in a few different ways and then match based off of price, but also on the specific type of workload. So for our memory optimized instances, these are recommended for, of course, memory intensive applications. This would be if a machine learning workload, if it caches a lot of data in memory, and your compute optimized instances can be helpful for your structured streaming applications where you need to make sure that the processing rate is above the input rate at peak times of the day. And these can also be used for distributed analytics and data science applications. Storage optimized instances type instance types, those are recommended for use cases that require higher disk throughput and IO. And general purpose instance types, these are recommended for enterprise grade applications 
working with relational databases and analytics with in-memory caching. So these are some high level recommendations. I assure you there are multiple edge cases that don't fit into these buckets, but these are the places that I would start as you start to create your clusters and experiment before moving things into production. There are two tiers of VM instances. We have on-demand and spot. So for on-demand instances, you pay for the compute capacity by the second, and there's no long-term commitment. The spot pricing changes in real time based on the supply and the demand of that compute capacity. So if the current spot market price is above the max spot price, the spot instances are terminated. And since spot instances are often available at a discount compared to on-demand pricing, for the same budget, you can significantly reduce the cost of running your applications. You can grow your application's compute capacity, and you call, can also increase throughput. Clusters can be created using a combination of on-demand and spot instances with, with, those, with those custom spot prices. So now you can tailor your clusters according to your use cases. We do recommend that you launch the cluster so that the Spark driver is on an on-demand instance, and then you're saving the state of the cluster even after losing spot instance nodes. If you choose to use all spot instances, which would then include the driver, any cache data or table will be deleted when you lose the driver instance due to the changes in the spot market. So be wary of that. So leverage spot pricing whenever possible based on your SLA. For non-mission critical jobs, we recommend using spot VMs for workers. And as I, again, I said on-demand VM for the driver. Workflows with type SLAs use spot instances with fallback to on-demand. The spot fallback to on-demand feature, if you're running a hybrid cluster that's a mix of the on-demand and spot instances, and if spot instances acquisition fails or you lose the spot instances, Databricks will fall back to using the on-demand instance and it provides you with the desired capacity. Without that option, you would lose the capacity provided by the spot instance for the cluster causing a delay or even a failure in your workload. And for production jobs, we recommend using the on-demand instances. All right, let's dive into cluster sizing, a few more recommendations and rules of thumb. So here are a few starting points for cluster sizing. Fewer big instances are generally preferred over more small instances so that you reduce network shuffle. And this mainly applies to batch ETL jobs. For streaming, you can start with smaller instances depending on the complexity of the transformations. This is not set in stone though, so the reverse would make sense in many cases. So sizing really does matter. You can size based on the number of tasks initially and then tweak it later. Run the job with a small cluster to get an idea of the number of tasks and use a two to three times task per core for base sizing. And then choose based on your workload. If your workload requires caching, then view the storage tab in the Spark UI to see if the entirety of the training data set is cached. If it's fully cached with room to spare, you can use fewer instances. If it's almost completely cached, you can increase the cluster size. If it's not even close to being cached, consider, consider memory optimized instances, which we mentioned earlier. Check to see if, 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 um, if things are being persisted in memory only or memory and disk in your ganglia charts. Look for spilling. Spilling to disk with SSD isn't so bad. If this is still not enough, though, then we'll talk about cluster sizing and the ETL workloads. So check, check if you're compute bound by viewing your CPU usage, again, with your ganglia metrics. And the only way to speed this work up is to add more cores. Then from there, this feels like we need a decision tree where you like start at the top. I think that would be a really great visual. That's that's a takeaway I'm going to work on after this. Next, check if you have uh, if you're network bound. So check for high spikes before compute heavy steps. Look for that in your ganglia charts. Use bigger and fewer machines to reduce the shuffle. Use an SSD backed instance for faster remote reads, and now those SSDs will automatically scale. 
Lastly, check if you are spilling a lot. Check the Spark SQL tab for spill and use memory optimized instances to address it. Additional cluster management best practices. So certain clusters uh, run 24 seven um, as an interactive cluster. It's recommended to restart those periodically. So you can pick up any new hot fixes in those uh, DVRs. Additionally, it's good practice to detach any unused notebooks from clusters. Attached notebooks to clusters, those do consume an amount of memory per language used per notebook. Use standard clusters for development activities and always run your production jobs on isolated job clusters. Remember, job clusters are cheaper, 22 cents per DBU compared to 55 cents per DBU for the all-purpose. Job clusters provide better resource isolation and streaming jobs have special monitoring built in them for the job clusters. Don't use auto scaling clusters for streaming jobs. Use pools to reduce your startup times and use pools plus spot instances for even more cost-effective pools. So let's take a look at a, a ganglia chart. So. Um, so let's say we begin with a general small and then we just run the ETL workload. So you see over here in red, red doesn't necessarily mean bad because what you're seeing is that you're, you're using everything that you requested that you allocated to use. Now you may need more, but at least we're not wasting any resources. If the ganglia server is red or orange, then CPU utilization is high again. So we may need to go larger. If it's low, then we're going to go smaller. So if it's low, it would be that instead of being red over there, it's like a blue, blue green. If there are, if there's any purple in your memory, in your memory chart, this is indicating swap and you might be spilling to disk. So we want to take a look at that and address by doubling our Spark SQL shuffle partitions or we can switch to uh, a memory small policy. To arrive at the correct cluster siving, it, it does take some iterative work. And there are, we, we do have, and a lot, this is all separate from DLT. So if we were to be having this conversation in the context of DLT, it would look very different because DLT is doing a lot of this management for you. So the approach here, develop on a medium size and then meet your functional requirements, run some more tests, optimize your cluster to remove any bottlenecks that you might find, take a look at all your ganglia charts. And there are quite a bit, there's quite a bit to dive into there. There's a lot available online, um, but also again, reach out to your essay or anyone on the support team and we can walk you through that. And focus on what your workload is. So machine learning versus streaming versus some basic ETL or interactive development workloads will require different instance types. So let's say we're focusing on machine learning. This usually requires a lot of caching of the data in memory. So focus on using those memory optimized VMs. Also consider storage optimized instances for large data sets. And to size a cluster, you could take a percentage of the data set, cache it, see how much memory it's used, and then extrapolate that to the rest of the data. For your streaming workloads, ensure that the processing rate is just above the input rate at the peak times of day. So you're using everything that you've allocated, not wasting resources. And depending on the peak input rate times, consider compute optimized VMs for the cluster to ensure that the processing rate again is in fact higher than the input rate. For your ETL workloads, your data size and the SLA of these workloads are your leading indicators. And Spark does not always require the data to be loaded into memory in order to execute the transformations, but just see how large the task sizes are on the shuffles and then compare that to the tasks throughout uh, the task throughput that you expected to see what your SLA needs to be. And to analyze the performance checking CPU, Make sure you do that. Look at your network or local I.O. and also consider using a general purpose VM for some of these jobs. And fourth, 
for your interactive workloads, for your ad hoc workloads, the ability for a cluster to auto scale is most important for these. Take advantage of that auto scaling feature so that you're managing the cost of your infrastructure. Okay, a couple more slides. I've been talking straight for 26 minutes, 25 minutes maybe. Before I go through this final section, is there anyone with a question? Have we gotten anything on the, um, has anything come in? I haven't taken a look. If we have any questions or not, I'm gonna take a sip of water. No, it looks like uh, everything's been really easy to understand, very straightforward. Uh, there's been a request for the uh, deck afterwards, but but that's all so far. Okay, awesome. So now I'll talk about a couple of different data sources. So let's say we're working with Kafka. So the default behavior for the Spark Kafka connector is to create one Spark partition for each Kafka topic. So start with a baseline cluster that has at least as many cores as there are topic partitions. And then use optional configurations to change the behavior. At the beginning of each micro batch, the map stage is going to spawn n number of tasks and being the number of topic partitions in that source. Ensure that you have, so you need to ensure that you have at least n cores so that your map stage will execute every task in parallel without there being any queuing. If you say have two end cores, then you'll have idle cores and your Kafka source then has two topics, each with four partitions. So there you'll want to create a cluster then with at least eight executor cores. If you have transformations in subsequent shuffle stages that spawn then more tasks than are available and your SLAs require an as fast as possible execution, add a multiplier to the baseline number of cores so that you increase that parallel processing. The Kinesis connector behaves a little bit differently. So instead of connecting to the source at the beginning of a micro batch to consume the records, there's a separate asynchronous process and that's fetching data into a buffer that exists across the cluster. And at the beginning of each micro batch, the entire contents of that buffer are read and processed. When you're sizing a cluster for a Kinesis source application, consider how many task slots are available to perform the prefetch and how many are available to execute the micro batch. And that's how you'll get the total number of cores. The number of task slots used to prefetch data is determined by the configuration shards per task, and the default is five. Use that information, uh, use that to inform the minimum number of cores that you'll need in order to perform the prefetch prefetch operation. In the event that you have very large Kinesis data streams with say thousands of shards, you might require many cores just for the prefetching. So consider tuning that. And the number of task slots used for the micro batch processing, that's going to vary depending on data volume and complexity. So understand how much data you're processing per micro batch as well as what your SLAs are so that you make sure and ensure that you get the number of cores that you need for processing. If you're working off of a data source that lives in the Delta Lake, sizing for the Delta Lake is simpler because there aren't any, there really aren't any connector related nuances. The size of the micro batch is controlled by using that max files per trigger option. And the default is a thousand files. You can also set the max bytes per trigger. Delta Lake sources are read in ascending order of the commit. And so ensure that your core capacity is a function of your overall commit size. Your parquet reads are generally bin packed or they're, they're, they're split into partitions that's determined by the configuration that you set. And again, that default is 128 megs. Uh, and then example is, so say you, com uh, you commit one gig, then Spark's generally going to spawn one gig per 128. So that's going to give you about eight tasks to read that data in the map stage, which means you'll want to have at least eight cores available to do this work in parallel. And lastly, if autoloader is your data source, sizing on autoloader source is it's very similar to the sizing on the Delta Lake source. 
depends largely on the size of each micro batch. You can control that with the cloud files, max files per trigger. And there are some additional complexities that come with making changes to the default values for fetch and the delete parallelism for file notification mode. So you'll wanna take a look at those as well. And of course there are other data sources that can be read and these are the, these are the four that I've highlighted for today's talk. All right, I never like to do a presentation where I'm talking for longer than 20 minutes and I've already been talking for 30 minutes. So with that, that is the end of the slide portion. I'd like to open it up for questions. We also have a few Databricks SMEs on the call. If there are any additional tidbits of information, any other nuggets that we can share with the group, I'd like to open up the call to others. So this you to raise your hand um, if, and then I can unmute you if you're interested in speaking. This is pretty complex stuff. I'm not going to lie. Like this, this all came to me within the last seven days, compiling resources and asking questions and, and working with, with my customers. So this is, it's a lot of math. <laughs> All right, we've got a question. What is the best way to extrapolate these recommendations from a test from test data to prod data type data pipelines? So definitely there were a couple of recommendations in there where we mentioned um, you know, whether or not you're gonna be using an all-purpose or a job. Um, so for, you know, once you have everything all set and ready to go, then you'll want your clusters to be running jobs. Um, if, if you have everything automated and, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to your, your SLA and your, the, the dollars associated. So there's a trade-off. So if you want things to be completed faster than, and, and have more, you know, have have more dependency on things always being up and running all the time, then you're going to pay more for that. Generally, in a staging environment or in a development environment, that's not so much the case. So you may not allocate those kinds of resources to a staging or a dev environment, but you may want to for prod. Great point. All right. Any any other questions? Any other comments from anybody on the line? All right. Well, with that, I would just like to thank you so much, Allison, for your time. This was very helpful. Um, looks like there's something. Oh no, that's just a comment. Okay. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you everybody for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>